I was literally two centimetres off my deck and already my rib cage was starting to get crushed. today is I am plotting the results that we got from our experiments, our trials out in Belfast Lock the other day. I've got my helpers with me and uh, sadly they're not very good at numbers so I'm having to do this myself. Um, what we're looking at is the difference between what the ship's magnetic compass, the big one that floats in the, in the ball near the, the steering wheel, uh, what that says and what direction the boat is actually travelling in. Now we're using GPS satellites to give us one direction and we're then comparing it with the ship's magnetic compass because sometimes as you turn the boat through say 10 or 20 degrees, say you turn it through 20 degrees, the compass might turn through 15 degrees or it might turn through 25. It just depends on the compass. They're all a wee bit different and they all have slight variations and you're supposed to know what those variations are and plot them on a chart. So we've got the differences between the magnetic direction that the compass says we're going and the direction that the GPS satellite says we're going and we're plotting that on this graph and the first part of it looks quite reasonable it comes over and it wiggles around a bit but from about here down it's a bit of a shambles because we haven't actually taken any measurements from that point so this this area here is completely blank it's like those old maps that used to say the undiscovered country this is it down here. So we've got to go back out and take more measurements for this. But what we're going to do is take the measurements for everything and replot them all again. If they stay in more or less agreement with this curve, then we've got a high level of confidence this curve is about right. If, on the other hand, this point moves from this side of the line to that side of the line, then everything's up for grabs because it obviously means there's no correspondence between the first set of measurements and the second set. Um, the other thing I'm having to do is just check and putting them in the right way around. So I've got the Yacht Master book open and I've got a sample compass deviation card here to look at. And um, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to have to redo this. It's fine as far as it goes, but it has to be redone. So um, if um, the compass is reading um, 120 and the GPS is reading 121, um, do you have it in the plus column or in the negative column for that? I've actually got some notation at the top. Um, and I don't actually know what it means. <laughs> so I'm going to have to revisit this whole thing. At the top I've got west is subtract from compass and east is add to compass. So I guess if it's in three degrees on the east column, you add three degrees to that magnetic one because it's three degrees behind where it should be. Hmm. So... Basically what I've got here is if the if, if the GPS is three degrees ahead of the compass, it counts as east. If the three if it's three degrees behind that compass, it counts as west. And uh, if we're getting this wrong, do put the comments down below because this is Beverly Ann and Gaynor learning <laughs> about all sorts of stuff, don't we, Bev? Actually, truth be told, and I'll probably get told off for this, I don't care whether it's right or wrong. Um, the reason I say that is most of the deviations here are about one or two degrees. And quite frankly, if I can sail within one or two degrees of my intended course when I'm up there out in the Rolly Sea, I'll be absolutely chuffed. Um, to have my compass being one or two degrees off from reality, I don't really care one way or the other. I, I can't sail that, that accurately. If it was 20 degrees off, I'd be a bit upset. But two? I'd love to be able to sail that accurately. So... Most of this is within my sailing error, if you want to call it that. So as far as I'm concerned, this line down the middle is too thin. It should be a big, big, thick line down the middle, about three degrees wide. That would work for me because I can't sail to the nearest degree. I'm just not that good at it. Well, this is a uh, early morning blog from uh, Gainer uh, because I'm glad to report that the washing machines are in. We have got washing machines at last here at Carrick. Um, it's a um, service wash now at the moment. So um, 
uh, my washing is uh, off to be um, laundered and I will get that this afternoon. Now, I just thought I'd give you an idea of what Beverly and I get up to. Beverly looks after the Salty Last blog and she does a blog every single week. I do Cook's Tour blog and I do one once a fortnight. So Beverly, being a good girl, has got her Thursday video in the can and ready and uploaded. I, who do Cook's Tour, mine's supposed to be going out today. Mine's three quarters done. Um, but we had visitors last night, so I didn't get it done. Didn't get it finished. But I've got to get it finished, uploaded, and then, yay, happy days. And then we'll wash and be done. So that's going to be my morning this morning. You go from one extreme to the other in UK weather. Uh, we've had absolutely horrendous gales. And now we've not got a breath of wind or anything much. Um, so Bev and I have decided to practice or think about our man overboard. Now we've got a couple of issues um, which is unique to our particular boat. The first is we, ha we sling our dinghy over the back and um, so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to have a quick release mechanism so that we can dump the dinghy because we can then bring people up using the swim platform so that if there is a man overboard we can at least get them on board um the other thing is um because um there's only going to be two of us uh really ever sailing this boat uh we've got to think about making sure that whatever we do we've got to be able to bring in somebody and not hazard you know hurt them in any way so we're going to practice some ideas that we're going through our head just to see if they work or not and if they don't work then we can basically throw them over the side much better to get rid of a an idea than a person so what are we doing Bev? Uh, fiddling with the dinghy um, what we've done is we've bought some little shackles which have got uh, these locking mechanisms on them and what we're going to do is we're going to use it to attach the dinghy. So the idea is that this would take the dinghy painters and um, I just put it on here for now. And basically what we could do is we could then pull these tight to, to pull the dinghy on. And you would say, well, why bother? You've got all this rope just tie it on. Well, the thing is, occasionally we need to get the dinghy off quickly and it takes ages to untie all these lines. So if we have something like this with a shackle, that we can just pull apart we can get the dinghy off much quicker and we have got one for this side one for that side and we've already got one in the middle now the other thing that people might say is well there's better shackles than that you could buy a swap shackle like this one and uh, which has the advantage that all you got to do is pull that and it just snaps open but the problem we've had with snap shackles is sometimes if they get banged they open all by themselves and that's not really something we want um, so we've gone for a lock shackle like this that clicks into place and I'm sure you can hear the click if I uh, <laughs> give me a bit of a devil to get going but yeah clicks into place and um, that's what we prefer to use this little bar stops the halyard knot sliding off it so it's locked in so what I'm going to do is I'll do it a little bit better than I have done and I'll show you how we're using it so we're going to take this we're going to take our dinghy line and lock the shackle off. There we go. We've got to get the lengths of these lines adjusted correctly. We haven't got that sorted out just yet. Um, so the idea is that we can then just pull the dinghy in tight like that. And then we can just, this is why the line length isn't right yet. Um, we can then just tie this off a few times in some way or other. I'm just going to do it like that. That line length needs to be shorter then. Well, this is why it needs to be shorter. But you can see it's on now. It's not going anywhere. And the idea is that if you need to release the dinghy quickly, you can simply do that, push the shackle in, and the dinghy can go off. <laughs> Oh, 
I'll hopefully get quicker at this. I'll do this one next. That can't be quite as tight there, Bev. We'll get it sussed as to... <laughs> this is supposed to be quick release, it ain't happening. Oh, that would help if I'd got it off. <laughs> what was the issue? Um, I hadn't got... <laughs> I was actually doing it the other way round. You know, crikey, this is well tight. This is supposed to be quick release here, folks. <laughs> it's not happening, Bev. Ah! <sighs> <Whew>. <sighs> listen to me but then that's normal right 20 minutes later and this is supposed to be quick release ah uh, you forgot to take the dinghy to the boat i haven't it's here <laughs> it's here <sighs> maybe next time take the central one off first Maybe, but we certainly need to just get it sorted as to how we get that off. But um, th the plan will come together. We can release this quickly because it's just that. No. Bev and I. I, I appreciate the commentary to camera, but can we get the harness out before it goes under the boat and tangles in the rudder? <laughs> All right, I'll go deal that. All right, let's give it a go. So. Since that's not under much tension, I'm going to just do that, push that one in with my thumb, give it a twist, turn it around 180 and it should just pop out. This one here should also give it a twist, push it in with my thumb, give it a twist, push it in with my thumb, give it a twist. Hey. That went better. It did go better, didn't it? Yeah. So we've just got to sort of like work out how we, um, um, oh, bye bye, dinghy. Yeah, anyway, I better retrieve the uh, harness. My yeah. turn. Yeah. No doubt there's a good reason why you're sitting on deck with the main halyard uh, attached to your life vest. Well, basically, um, Bev and I are practicing our man overboard <laughs> with the gulls and everything. But we now have a, a mechanism for releasing the dinghy. So if we need to, we can just get rid of that so we can pull people up. But we're just looking about uh, putting the halyard on the life vest. And I, as somebody who's just practiced it now, it is definitely the last resort. Because they do say, um, you know, to pull somebody up in your life vest is the last resort. And it's mainly because you would have, the casualty will have no ribs worth a damn by the end of the process. Pev was just lifting me up a little bit and I could tell that the, my back of my ribs and everything, they would be crushed if uh, we had to do this for real. So, um, a different plan. We're going to have to think of a different way of getting somebody aboard this boat. And we also have to think, wonder why every gull and carrick has turned up here. <laughs> no, it's just just the way it is. <laughs> okay, so what's the latest exciting adventure in man overboard recovery? <laughs> well, basically, um, because um, we've got choices of sort of like putting the dinghy in, it means that because we're going to have slung the dinghy, we've got the bridle that we use free. Um, and um, that will work. The only problem is... <laughs> The, only the, problem casualty, is, sorry, the only problem is the casualty will fall through the middle of this. That is no doubt about that. 
but something like this um, will work so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify this one and I'm going to create a dedicated um, bridle uh, ah. for this boat I don't see why you're going to modify this one because I thought we had already agreed that until you made a new bridle neither of us would fall overboard <laughs> but I'm going to modify this one because I can get this done and then at least I've got a backup because I like to have backups So what have you just discovered? It's not really I've discovered, but it's just that um, Beverly's uh, line fell off, um, um, and she, and it fell off into the marina at an inappropriate time. And uh, we think I think it's because the uh, my pipe is that bent that it could have just sort of like pulled the shackles off. So what I've done is I've just. Um, whip them to the actual rope itself because I don't use this rope for anything else other than coming into a marina. Well I'm on the hunt for um, a hose to do the water because the storm's due in tonight it's going to be force five gusting it according to the forecast and so we're going to fill the water tanks and secure the boat. Um, so I'm out in my um, jacket and my penguin hat because it's theoretically summer but <laughs> sometimes around here you would never be quite so sure of that so I've got to find myself a hose there's one around here somewhere I've just got to locate it well got the hose get the water in and um, get on with it it's a lovely day in a way. It's cold, the wind isn't particularly warm. There's cloud, there's skiffs of rain. And of course the virus is playing havoc with all our planning. So just gonna get the water in, get the boat tied up, put a safety spring on it just to make sure we don't get pushed into the pontoon and settle in for the day. There's not really that much else to do, to be honest. Well, that's that done. So the water's in. I've put a third of a ton of water into the boat. Um, and I've got an extra spring line on her for safety so she doesn't get pushed into the pontoon by the winds. The, um, going into a big storm, we generally put water in the tanks. Um, putting the extra weight in the boat just gives her more stability. It makes her a wee bit harder to push around by the waves. It's got a bit more momentum. And um, it never hurts to fill tanks of water. So generally speaking, we would normally have turned the boat by now and have her facing into the wind for this storm but the wind direction is fairly variable it's probably going to come from the west um, if it does come from directly behind us we'll just drop the spray hood so um, that's not really an issue we've done that before it's, it's fine if we do that but uh, that's where we are so now we just wait and see if the weather forecast is right <laughs> but in any case i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to go down below and i'm going to stick some bangers and mash into mr d our thermal cooker and in two or three hours time hopefully we'll have a delicious dinner but We've already got a video for that, so I'm not doing it again. If you want to see it, I'll put a link up there. And if you don't want to see it, I wouldn't click on the link if I was you. All right, well, that's it for now. Time to go below decks, cup of tea, and take it from there.